Good evening, everyone. Grace and peace. Uh, I wanted to name just how incredibly grateful I am to all of the artists at the table um, who add just you know, such a, a richness and really a, a depth um, to our just our worship experience. I saw in the comments, um, Roy Parker had mentioned that and just thanking the worship team. And um, so I just wanted to second that. I'm so grateful. Tonight it was Ryan and Gary. Um, you know, normally it's um, Mindy is our worship leader and then her just entire team. I won't go through everyone because inevitably I'll forget someone. Um, but I'm just, I'm really grateful for, for those folks. So uh, yeah. All right. Second, I also want to just, just name how um, just, it was just so good. Like Maggie mentioned, just to see your faces, many of your faces last week at our our drive-through communion one-year anniversary time. That's a very long title. Um, but it was just, it was great just to have this moment, you know, this small moment of reconnection in the midst of kind of a, you know, a desert of relational isolation um, that so many of us have been experiencing. So that was really, um, it was just beautiful. So thank you for those who, who made it out. That meant so much. So tonight is the sixth and the, the final part of our series um, titled Scripture Dealing with Difficult Texts. And throughout this series, uh, we have been looking at various passages and topics. Um, like Maggie mentioned, often that kind of make us squirm. You know, the I mean, from passages that seem quite anti-gay to uh, verses that portray God as quite violent. Um, we've been just discussing all the undiscussable things. And while I didn't realize it quite when we began this series, um, in so many ways, this really has been a chance for us to sort of um, just talk about some of the theology, some of kind of the, the approach to Christian faith that makes the table a bit unique. Um, at, and not so much unique historically. I think we're still in the tradition, like the long tradition of the church. Um, but kind of in our more you know, conservative Bible belt, Bible belt, largely evangelical Christian context. Um, you know, we have a few things that are a little bit, a little bit quirky, a little bit different in our theology. And so this series has been, um, you know, a chance for us to kind of express some of that, which has, I think, been really helpful. So, you know, with that in mind, if you missed previous messages um, in this series, I encourage you to go back and give it a listen. Um, give those messages a listen. Just, they, they've just proven quite important to who we are as a community. I think they'll give you some clarity. So, all right, let's get into our message for tonight. It is titled, Us for Them. Us for Them. And our primary texts are going to be John uh, chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, and then Acts chapter 4, verses 8 through 12. Uh, we'll start with this passage from John. So this is Jesus speaking, and he says this, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, uh, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. All right, now Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, well then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, Peter's, he's a real crowd pleaser, <laughs> whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven to which mankind, uh, by which we are given to mankind, by which we must be saved. All right. So as you can hear, uh, these passages, you know, they, they don't seem to be naming that Jesus is one revelation of God among others. 
Uh, instead, as I've really been saying throughout this series, they're, they're naming that Jesus is the highest, the, the most true, the most beautiful and powerful revelation of God that we have. So here's the question that I've been wrestling with. How can I confess that Jesus is Lord and yet still be for people of other religious traditions? And the reason this has been on my mind is because a few years ago, I came across a quote that, that in many ways cut me kind of to the quick. It was by the Indian uh, Hindu historian and philosopher named Ananda Kumaraswamy. And if you know anything about Indian history, you know the British controlled India as a colony for like nearly 200 years. And Britain was largely Christian, so of course Christian missionaries, you know, flooded in to convert the heathen in India. But then India is largely Hindu and Muslim, so there was, there was just a lot of, you know, pushback and religious tension, is kind of putting it mildly. So, so it's, it's really in the midst of that context uh, that basically whenever Kumaraswamy was in dialogue with a Christian leader or like a Christian pastor or... or writer or something, he would often say some version of this quote. This is the quote I came across. He said, even if you are not on our side, we are on yours. And that is something that all your zeal cannot take away from us. Isn't that beautiful? Even if you are not on our side, we are on yours. What's he saying? Well, in effect, he's saying, look, Even if you Christians do not support us, we support you. Even if you want to fight us, we do not want to fight you. Even if you won't love us, we love you. In another version of this line, um, he doesn't use the language of side, but instead he simply says, even if you are not for us, we are for you. I think the reason this cut me to the quick was because it's so kind and generous. I mean, it would almost be easier to dismiss if Kumar Swami, if he just said, oh, so you think you're right? You Christians come in here trying to convert us. You think you're right? Well, you're not. You're not right. We're right. And then, you know, we could kind of fight and feel real good about ourselves. But instead, his posture, it it seems to be so, dare I say it, (laughs) Christ-like. I mean, it sounds so much like the Jesus who said, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Even if you are not on our side, we are on yours. Now, this brings up the question of, of, you know, why Kumar Swami would put put it quite that way. Why would he feel like Christians are not for him or for people of differing religious traditions? Why would he feel that we are in some sense against them? Now, obviously, that's a big question with a long history, some of which I already named above, at least in his specific, you know, context. Uh, I mean, I mean, it gets into all sorts of complicated questions, like, what does it mean to, um, you know, engage, like, to be a missionary, to engage a different culture um, and people and religion with the good news of Jesus? I mean, is it okay to, like, proselytize and try to convert others? Uh, and I mean, if Jesus is Lord, wouldn't you want to invite others to worship the Lord? But in, is that kind of forcing your beliefs on that? You know, it, it very quickly, um, this gets quite complex, and a little messy. Um, so rather than getting into all of those questions right now, um, let me just start by naming that I think lurking in the background of a lot of those questions, uh, is, is the the question of hell and who goes there. I I do think our doctrine of hell has quite a bit to do with it. Uh, This, of course, goes right back to my message two weeks ago. Uh, Many of you will will recall that's that's kind of what we unpacked. Um, And and kind of what I named was that a version of the gospel that says something like this, you know, through the cross of Jesus, a very small minority of human beings who have ever lived, i.e. the Christians, will be united with God forever, while the vast majority of people who did not believe, or perhaps never even heard, will be tortured for all eternity by a loving God. (laughs) Um, You can see how that would, that put a bit of a damper on our relationship with people of other (laughs) religious traditions. Uh, And I think that's true for a number of reasons. I mean, A, it can, it can kind of make us feel quite superior you know, which that doesn't lend itself to good relationships. And B, it can, it can also just make us feel plain anxious, kind of giving us that sense of, 
uh, you know, like, oh, I'm just, I'm worried for you. I, 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 I kind of need you to change. I need you to change for your own good. I, I don't want you to burn in hell forever. And, and so you can see how that also doesn't lend itself to, um, you know, maybe the healthiest of, of relationships. So, so I do think, you know, changing how we view hell and judgment, knowing that Christ died for all and that in the end, his love will find us, heal us, restore us. Uh, and that it's not about, you know, simply saying the magic word, Jesus, but, but about orienting ourselves towards love. I do think that that starts to change things for us as we relate to people of other faiths or of no faith at all. Um, because, you know, suddenly it's not like we are the insiders. You know, we are God's favorites, the only ones going to the good place, and they are the outsiders. Uh, no, no, God loves everyone. God died for everyone, God rose again for everyone, and God will, in the end, uh, find a way to save everyone. I believe that. Uh, and, and I do think that that helps, helps us kind of relate to people um, because we're no longer just anxious for them in the sense of, oh, I need you to believe just like me or else you're going to be tortured forever. Uh, so, so in other words, when, when we no longer understand hell as eternal conscious torment, um, we removed a very large elephant from the room, so to speak. So uh, that's all good and helpful, but it, it does still leave the question, how do I as a Christian think about and relate to other religious traditions and the people that adhere to them? Because you see, when, when I began to, um, even if you go back and listen to my message, um, or if you were here two weeks ago and you listened to it, like, the way I unpacked um, this kind of new understanding of hell, what I named was that God in Christ is drawing all people to himself, right? So it's very Christian, um, and it's very inclusive, right? I mean, I'm not, I'm not leaving out people, um, but I am saying that Jesus is doing the saving, right? Which presumably means that, um, I mean, however you want to frame it, that other religious figures or gods or whatever are not doing the saving, or at the very least, not to the, to the same degree. And, um, and thus, you know, I'm saying that, that as a Christian, um, that, I mean, that would just kind of presume that, that somehow, you know, focusing on Christ or centering on Christ is, um, you know, kind of gets you closer to ultimate truth than other traditions and belief systems. Um, that may sound really, I don't know, rude or, um, uh, yeah, I don't know how that strikes people, but I, I think that's kind of embedded in Christian faith. I mean, to say, you know, Jesus is Lord, um, you know, kind of means he's the Lord. <laughs> so it's, it's, like I said, it's kind of complicated. Like, how does this, what does this mean for how I relate to people? Um, so, so in other words, like, perhaps then we're just sort of stuck, like, Either Jesus is Lord and all the things we just read in Acts, you know, 4, 8 through 12 and John 14, like all those things are true. So Jesus is Lord and we agree with that. And so we're automatically tempted by this sort of arrogance and the worst sort of Christian triumphalism. So either that or, or if we let go of that, uh, well, then we aren't arrogant anymore uh, but we've also sort of lost our Christian identity and, and really any teeth in the call to discipleship, right? This powerful call to align ourselves with the, the God revealed in Jesus, the God who is love. And, and honestly, I think that's, that's a beautiful um, call and that's not something to just let go of. Uh, but there you have it, right? That's the, that's the dilemma, um, to put it in slightly different words, do we still boldly proclaim Jesus is Lord and then let that kind of trip us up with a temptation toward arrogance? Or do we let go of the idea that Jesus is Lord and that through him all creation will be saved, but then we've lost our Christian identity? So, so this kind of begs the question, all right, is there a way beyond this, um, beyond this impasse, so to speak? So as I've been reflecting on this for the last few weeks, where my mind just kept going, was back to our need for what I'll call a better, more robust, that's such a Brett word, robust doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Also a Brett word, doctrine. Perhaps that word sounds kind of stodgy. Um, it just means, you know, essential Christian teaching, doctrine of the Spirit. And I think 
that we often get the idea that God is somehow limited to us and our people, you know, Christian people, that God is somehow limited even to the church, and that if you want to encounter God or reach out for God or meet God in any way, then you must call yourself a Christian or go to a church or take communion or read the Bible. And until that happens, well, sorry, you may think you're experiencing God, but really it's probably just the demons fooling you. Uh, and of course, I no, I, I just I don't think that's true. I mean, honestly, like just think of your own life. Uh, how many of us look back on our lives long before we were ever Christians, and and we can unmistakably see that the Holy Spirit, right, the Spirit of God, was calling us and drawing us towards God's self. Can you kind of, do you have those experiences like as you look back? And how many of us have, like perhaps you've maybe studied another religion um, or just, you know, you've, you've interacted with one a bit and you found in its teachings um, marvelous, good, and just beautiful things. Um, like how many of us have met someone from a very different uh, faith and we get the, hey, sweetie. I know what happened to the sink. You know what happened to the sink? Yeah, you see. Oh, good. That's such good news. Um, so I'm talking to some friends. Can I, can, I finish, can I finish this up? If someone put too much in the sink. Oh, they put too much. Oh, that does it every time, huh? Someone put too much in the sink. Okay? Sweet. Love you lots. <laughs> I love you. Oh, she's blowing me kisses. Oh, thank you. Um, I love... Church online, full of surprises. All right, so um, how many of us have met someone from even a different faith, right? So now I'm not talking about studying, like reading their holy book or something, but I'm talking about just a personal relationship where you you know someone of a different faith and, and you get the sense that they might be a better Christian, so to speak, than you are. <laughs> like, like they're already better. In fact, you might even say that the fruit of the Spirit, right? You might ask, what do you mean by better? I mean, you know, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and, and so on. Like, it's all there. It's all happening in them. I mean, not that they're, you know, perfect, but you just get the sense that, that, that somehow um, through their life, their experiences, their relationships, and even their religious tradition, like, they're, they're meeting God in some um, very real way. All right, so what am I driving at? This is what I'm trying to name. That God, through the presence of the Holy Spirit, is accessible and available to all people. That's what I'm naming. God, through the presence of the Holy Spirit, is accessible and available to all people. You say, who are all people? Well, all people, everyone, to, to Buddhist people and Hindu people and Muslim people and non-religious people, and on and on it goes. God, God is present and available to all people. Now, perhaps this is making you nervous. You're like, is this in the Bible? So let's look at this text. This is Acts chapter 17. Uh, this is the Apostle Paul preaching to a non-Christian audience. Um, in Acts 17, verses 24 through 28, uh, Paul said this, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and he does not live in temples built by human hands. Can you see how he's already kind of setting the stage for this, this kind of idea of God's spirit, you know, being in and through all things and being present to people? He does not live in temples built by human hands, and he is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. What's that saying? I mean, the, your very breath is, is a gift of God. It's, it's, it's through the presence of God, right? It's this miracle. Can you hear kind of the doctrine of the Spirit there? God's presence and availability to everyone? Verse 26, from one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history, in the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. 
though he is not far from any one of us. Isn't that beautiful? For he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, like literally our existence is sustained by God. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. In other words, even non-Christian people can be in touch with God, can begin to discern what goodness is, can discern that we are all, as he said, offspring, we are all children of God, and thus begin to live in a way that delights God. And of course, of course um, Paul's a Christian, right? So he goes on from there to, to name, to articulate that, that what was sort of seen vaguely or intuited um, what was what was somewhat hidden before is now made more clear in Jesus Christ. Um, but notice, Paul isn't saying, oh, you people don't know anything. Oh, you've never had any connection to God at all. How would you know right and wrong? How, how could you claim to know God in any way? You, you've all been doing nothing but worshiping demons. No. No, instead he assumes a certain level of revelation. He assumes that, that actually people do know God. And then he goes on to proclaim what he believes is the highest, the most profound revelation of God in Jesus Christ. So, so what does this kind of change for us? Um, well, I want to get at that um, from a quote. I love this quote. This is from a theologian named Nicholas Healy, uh, where he's reflecting on, on this idea that through the Holy Spirit, God is present to all people. Um, and that his, um, his grace and love meet them there, even if, you know, maybe they've never even heard the name Jesus or something. Uh, this is what Healy says. The non-church world is thus not only the place in which the church is to witness to its Lord, right, that would be Jesus, it is also the place from which the church may learn about its Lord and about true discipleship. Key words there, may learn learn about its Lord. I love it. I, I really think this starts to change our mindset um, because suddenly, see, when I interact with someone who is not a Christian, um, on the one hand, I feel like I can bring my full self, right, and my full beliefs and all my convictions about who Jesus is. Um, I don't have to be mousy about that. I don't have to pretend like, oh, I really don't think Jesus is all that great because, you know, I wouldn't want to offend you and I know how fragile you are. Uh, no, no, I can bring my full self. And guess what? So can they, right? They can bring their full selves, all their convictions and beliefs. But here's the key. Dialogue doesn't have to break down into a monologue. Why? Just because I believe Jesus is Lord does not mean I have nothing to learn from them. In fact, they may teach me something about the God who is love. They may teach me something about what faithfulness to God and to Christ looks like. Uh, this, is, this is not just theory for me. This is something that's been very true in my own life. Uh, for years, uh, I could not really pray in any consistent way. I was sort of that guy who for three days would be up at 6 a.m. to pray. Like, I would redouble my efforts. I was like, I'm going to do it. Uh, and then, you know, I wouldn't pray again for like two weeks and then back for a day and then off for a month. And I was just, I was bad at prayer. Uh, I mean, I would try, right? I would sit down to pray, but my mind would wander. I would have this expectation of experiencing God. And then I'd be discouraged when nothing happened. And I just, I didn't like it. I didn't like praying. I just didn't get it. Uh, and, and I didn't get, I just didn't understand like how, how this was supposed to kind of happen, quite what I was supposed to feel. And I felt bad. Like I felt guilty. Christians should pray. Jesus talked about that. Um, and yet today I pray nearly every day. I really like to pray. Uh, you know who taught me to pray? Zen Buddhists. Is that weird? It was basically through their books and their writings that I started to get it. I learned the value of sitting my butt down and putting away the distractions in all the ways, the myriad of ways, that I run from myself and from God. And it was actually through silence and meditation that I then learned, oh, 
<laughs> oh, now I get it. From this place, from this quiet place, now, now I can speak words to God that resonate. I learned that prayer is primarily presence. And it was actually through Zen teachers as they talked about Christian contemplatives like Thomas Merton and Meister Eckhart and Julian of Norwich that I learned about the whole Christian kind of mystical contemplative tradition um, that also values silence. Like, in other words, it took a different religious tradition to help me learn about my own tradition. Like, they were all talking about Christians. And I'm like, who are these people? I never heard of these people. So I took the Buddhists that teach me about Christianity. Uh, and then once I learned, then all of a sudden, I'm like off and running. And I'm, honestly, I'm a better Christian today. I am more faithful to Christ because of what they taught me. Uh, now, now, I mean, you know, everything you find in every philosophy and religious tradition is all just sunshine and rainbows. Like, of course not. Right? Evil is present in, in every culture and every tradition. Um, but heck, that, even the church isn't exempt from that. Like, if you know any church history, we've had um, some dark days. <laughs> so, so, right, we have to be wise. We have to discern. Um, but that should not stop us from approaching people and traditions very different than our own in, in a spirit of kindness and thoughtfulness and humility. Because sometimes it's from them that we will learn about our Lord and about Christian discipleship. You see, it's not us versus them, is it? It's us for them. So to come back to our original question, uh, how can I be Christian and yet also be for people of other religious traditions? I kind of want to sum this up. How, how can I desire to witness to others about the beauty of Christ and yet not get super weird and feel the need to like force them to change? Um, and I actually think it's not like all that complicated. It's, it's not easy, but it's simple. Um, when I interact, I am there both to witness to the God who is love and to learn about the God who is love. That means it's give and take. And now we have the basis for dialogue and relationship. And when you couple that kind of insight with my message two weeks ago, um, right, about hell, I think you can see how, as the Christian writer Brian McLaren says, um, that too often when we quote the verse about Jesus being the way, that's in the passage I read uh, above in John 14 at the very end, um, it sounds like we're often saying he's in the way, right? Jesus is the way, um, as though he's in the way, as if, McLaren says, as if people are trying to come to God, but Jesus is blocking the path. <laughs> and he's saying like, oh no, you don't. You have to get by me first. <laughs> uh, in other words, Jesus isn't blocking the way. He is opening up a way for all people and everyone to connect with God. And I think those two insights together can become a very beautiful path for us to be both Christian and yet emotionally and relationally for people very different than ourselves. It truly is us for them. So before I pray, let me point you in the direction of just a few resources if you'd like to learn more um, about these things. The first is a video um, this is a, a talk by Rowan Williams called The Finality of Christ in a Pluralistic Society. You can find it on YouTube. If you search any of those words in the name Rowan Williams, it will come up. Uh, and then um, second is a book, A New Kind of Christian by Brian McLaren. All right, let me go ahead and pray for us. Jesus, we love you. Um, we're so grateful for the way that you've opened up um, for us and all people. And, um, and we also, God, ask forgiveness for, for how we've let that become the source of pride. We've let that kind of divide us and, and distance us from people and um, even caused us or it's, it sort of tempted us to slip into this arrogant mode where we're the people with all the answers uh, and none of the questions. And God, we repent for that. And we ask um, that you would renew us, 
that you would give us a new way of relating to folks and um, that it would be beautiful and life-giving where we can both um, name who you are and what you've done in our lives and yet also listen and learn and be ready to hear um, what your Holy Spirit has taught them. God, so lead us all into truth, into beauty, into goodness. Lead us all in the way of Jesus. It's in the life-changing name of Christ that I pray. Amen.